For all the praise I've just heaped on this movie, I feel I do have to return to the point of this video, which is that this movie is a mess. Yes, all of that dark Superman stuff is pretty brilliant, but it still exists in a movie where a lot of stupid shit happens, so the whole ends up being less than the sum of its parts precisely because of this inconsistency. But this is still way, way better than what we could have gotten, because if the Salkins had gotten their way initially, there wouldn't have even been all this good stuff to talk about. It would have just been bad through and through. Oh. Jesus. What is that? What the fuck is that? I mentioned earlier an early treatment for this movie written by Ilya Salkind, one that involved Supergirl, Brainiac, and Mr. Mixer's Pitalik. I said I'd come back to it, and I think I'll do that now because we've established the quality of the movie as it exists, so now let's look into an alternative universe where it could have been so, so much worse. Buckle in, kids, this gets really insane really, really quickly. By the way, I will be summarizing this a bit, so I can't cover every detail of this absolute lunacy, but I will link the treatment so you can read it yourself because, oh boy. To get an early indication, of this treatment's quality, it begins with the suggestion that off-screen Lois will move to Hong Kong to get away from being in the same city as Superman, now working as a foreign correspondent for the Daily Planet. Pretty clearly both a terrible writing choice just to get rid of a main character off-screen, and a fuck you to Margot Kidder for having the audacity to tell the Salkins they suck. Anyway, so in the treatment Clark is sad about this, but then Lana gets introduced as the new star reporter for the planet, and she and Clark take a liking to each other. The treatment seems to imply that the Salkins just forgot that Clark and Lana are already knew each other from high school. Whoops! So the treatment then sets up the introduction of Supergirl and Brainiac. See, what happened was Supergirl's ship landed on Brainiac's planet, so Brainiac adopted her as his own daughter. But then she grew up, and Brainiac decides he wants to fuck her. Hmm. Incest. Kids movie, Salkind. Oh yeah, Supergirl never gets a name in this treatment, by the way, outside of Supergirl. So Brainiac tries to count Olaf Supergirl, but she declines his marriage proposal and flies away to Earth, where she becomes a gym teacher? while Brainiac scours the universe for her with his remarkable technical genius. That's an actual quote from this treatment, by the way. Anyway, so Supergirl eventually decides to get in on the whole superhero thing, and eventually because of this, she and Superman meet, and then they... <laughs> they fall in love. Oh my god! Now, it's worth noting that Ilya Salkin specifies that these versions of Superman and Supergirl are not related like they are in the comics, but there's something about changing a pair of cousins into non-related characters just to set them up to fall in love that feels wrong. However, if you thought this treatment's insanity had ended with two counts of technical incest before the end of the first act, you'd be very much mistaken. It gets weirder. So Brainiac lands on Earth and sets up headquarters in a European castle. You know, for vibes. It's only a model. Shh. He discovers that Superman and Supergirl are in love, and he formulates a plan. Is it to kill Superman? To keep him hostage? No, it's to build a machine that affects his personality so he can make Superman act evil. Then when the entire world hates him and Supergirl is confused, Brainiac appears to Supergirl and says, I'll turn the machine off and leave Superman alone if you marry me, but if you don't, I'll make him eviler. Huh? Look, not to nitpick at a clearly insane premise, but surely if you're committing to the turn him insane plan rather than killing him, wouldn't the more logical form of manipulation be make Superman evil, then either A, force Supergirl to kill him, or B, go, see Supergirl, you can't trust the others, come back to me instead. These plans are sick and twisted, but in the context of the sick and twisted relationship Brainiac has with Supergirl, they make more sense? Turning the machine off just sets him up to be defeated and, uh, the Salkins wrote themselves into a wall in a script treatment. Nice. So Supergirl agrees to marry Brainiac as a front for finding his weakness, and she follows him to his castle in Europe. Superman is set free from the machine's grasp, so obviously he searches for Supergirl. And then, Mr. Mix's Pitalik is there. I am not kidding. He just appears, goes, what's up, dickhead, and then plays a bunch of pranks that Superman now has to stop instead of saving Supergirl. This is clearly only here for padding out the prospective screenplay. It is a fatally stupid idea. So Superman makes Mix's Pitalik say clip Zixum, then receives a communication communication from Supergirl via X-ray vision, no I'm not making that up, so he shows up at the European castle and tells Brainiac that he's nicked. Brainiac goes, nah uh, sticks Superman in an energy cage, and then he escapes with Supergirl by, <laughs> by starting up a time portal he's had this whole time and going back to the Middle Ages. I felt like I was on cocaine when I was reading this. So anyway, Jimmy Olsen and Lana Lang turn up because they got sent to Europe because something something Clark is in danger or 
or some shit, and they free Superman. The three then follow Brainiac into the past, who has now decided his life mission is to kill Superman, and then to fuck his adopted daughter. When the three arrive at the palace in the past, Brainiac takes Jimmy and Lana as hostages, then turns the evil Superman machine to maximum. However, Superman is so in love with Supergirl that it just doesn't work. That's the power of love. So Superman escapes back into the present, leaving Supergirl, Jimmy, and Lana behind. When he gets back to the present, he phones up Mixer's Pitalik and makes a deal with him. The two go back to the past, where dear old Mixie, no, I'm not calling him by his full name again, I keep fucking that up for sure, throws them into a dimension where Superman and Brainiac don't have powers so they can have a duel with lances and shit, cause fuck you. Obviously Superman wins, so Brainiac is left in this other dimension to rot while everyone else returns back to the present. But whoops to Daisy, Mixie's not done yet, in one final joke, he freezes time, then explodes Metropolis into puzzle pieces and tells Superman he has to solve it in one minute or he'll send the pieces to Mercury. Why? I don't know. Doesn't really matter anyway, because obviously Superman and Supergirl solve the puzzle and then send Mixie back to the fifth dimension. And then I guess the movie ends? The world just accepts that Superman wasn't bad really and that it was Brainiac controlling him, and Ilya has the cheek to set up a possible marriage story between Superman and Supergirl for Superman 4. This was written by a man who got paid to produce movies. I actually can't wrap my head around that. Moving past all the incest, which is a sentence I guess I have in this video now, this treatment is fundamentally broken. Nothing in it seems motivated by any traceable internal logic. Shit just happens. It's also in a constant need to one-up itself with the most outrageous imagery you can think of, like it's going, oh, you thought that was wild? Now check this. The result is that you feel less like you're reading a treatment for a multi-million dollar film, and more like you just got done listening to your five-year-old nephew Joey's cool idea for a new Superman movie. Why, why is Joey American? The characterization of Brainiac present is also just downright offensive. In the comics, Brainiac was, well, a Brainiac. A genius slash cyborg slash robot depending on whether it was the 60s, yes, who was hell-bent on universal domination. Nothing fancy, but you know, it works. But in this treatment, there's no hint of any grand schemes like that. Everything he does is in aid of trying to bang his adopted daughter. Now I could say, well maybe the Salkins thought this was a thing because they got confused with Brainiac 5's love for Supergirl in the comics, but that might have been giving them credit for ever, you know, picking up a comic book. I mean, Ilya admits at least once in this treatment they have to check with DC Comics about their script, so it's evident that he had no idea what the fuck he was on about here. He did get Mixer's Pitalik right in terms of character, but you'd have to be functioning at the brain power of a Spectrum ZX to mess that one up. So yeah, if it ever depresses you that the third movie in the Superman franchise is one where Richard Pryor skis off a high-rise or where this happens, just remember, it could have been worse. We could have had a Superman 3 where Brainiac is trying to do incest and Dudley Moore turns up for no reason halfway in. This is the good place. But if we have a window into how this movie could have been infinitely worse, is there a world where it could have been better? Could there have been a version of Superman 3 that, with the ingredients given to us, been an absolute belt? I think yes. And this might be the most frustrating takeaway from this movie. It is steeped in potential. There is so much in this movie that could have, in another world, made for the greatest Superman film of all time. But all of it is squandered by crammed storylines, terrible writing, and self-indulgent directing. So to cap this video off, let's do a little thought experiment. Let's think of ways to pull Superman 3 apart, then put it back together into a movie that really works. The first thing we need to do is pull the movie apart into its components, the storylines that are all running concurrently to make this movie what it is. The first component is of course the wacky comedy element, but that isn't a storyline, more so just a thread. We have the mad computer storyline, where Gus is helped by Webster to build his mad genius computer for the purposes of Webster's global domination, which becomes sentient and decides on global domination by itself. We of course have the red kryptonite storyline, which explores Superman's dark side. We have the story of Clark returning to Smallville and rekindling his friendship with Lana and all the feelings that would explore. Then of course there are the smaller threads to consider. The allusions to oil in the environment the movie comes back to from time to time. There are the obvious musings on the role technology has in modern life. All the stuff like that. The next thing we need to do is lay down a couple of ground rules for how this is going to work because I need a guideline to hold myself to. The first rule is that we will assume that Lois and Lex still aren't in it. This might be an alternate universe version of Superman 3, but I don't really see an alternate reality where 
the Salkins aren't massive weenies, so we're going to continue to assume they're not letting Kidda be in the movie and that Hackman still isn't touching it with a 30 meter pole. So we will still have Lana and we will still have Webster, though for reasons that will become clear, I am tempted to rename him Morgan Edge. The next rule is that we will continue to assume that Brainiac is never named. While it's reasonably obvious to me that the computer is a sort of Brainiac adaptation, not explicitly naming it so is a smart move given the lore attached to the character of Brainiac in the comics. Once we have all that, we have to pick and choose between all the threads and stories I listed just now. No good version of this movie uses all of these ideas all at once. There's just too much going on for that to be feasible. But if we can take two of the storylines at a time and weave in one of the more thematic threads in to tie them together, then we might be on the road to having something golden. The first of these ideas I have would be a lot more focused on the story of Gus Gorman and his computer, as well as the concept of the evil Superman. For the purposes of this video, I will call this the Brainiac story. In this story, we will assume all the Smallville stuff is excised, or at the least, simplified. This is a shame, but it thematically doesn't have much to do with what this script would be about, that being the alarming control that technology can, and indeed does, have over our lives. Smallville just doesn't really fit into this equation. Which is a shame, because I really like to keep all the Clark and Lana stuff in this idea, but it doesn't quite fit. However, we will be keeping the acid factory fire around the beginning and the thread about Lorelai being smarter than she pretends to be, because these will become important later. So in this story idea, we're keeping Gus and his storyline, but rearranging it a bit. We'll start with him being busted for stealing from Webster, where of course he will be employed to do work for Webster. It's revealed he does all this from a computer he built by himself, one more powerful than any other, but still quite small at this point. Webster agrees to help expand the computer to Gus's full vision for it, as long as Gus uses the computer to do what he's told. From there, the story would follow Gus as his capers with the computer grow more and more grand as it is assembled. We'd start small here, a bit of stock manipulation for example. It might even be fun for Webster to tell Gus to tank the Daily Planet stock through the computer in revenge for what he perceives as bad press, giving Clark a personal reason to investigate the goings on. However, as Gus moves from stock manipulation to control by chaos, be it through causing traffic jams or, if you really want to, having his computer manipulate weather, Superman becomes a fly in the ointment to Webster's plan any fears being found out. He has Gus use his supercomputer to recreate kryptonite, but it still doesn't quite get it right yet. This leads to the creation of the red kryptonite, and things can proceed pretty much as they do in the movie from this point onwards. Superman becomes a prick, Webster occasionally uses him for his own purposes, that sort of thing. However, one thing we'll add into this is throughout we'll show hints that the computer is doing things by itself, like looking into the world's nuclear armaments. But then things will really change again at the end, when Superman comes to destroy the computer. Here, instead of Vera being possessed by the computer, Computer, it would be Gus, a sort of creator becomes the monster kind of thing. If you really want to imply the connection to Brainiac, you could stick the three red lights from the comics onto Gus's forehead too. The computer would then speak through Gus, expressing an utter contempt for humanity and a will to destroy it entirely. He would then shoot Superman with a kryptonite beam, the real stuff this time, and is only prevented from killing Superman when Lorelei makes an attempt to shut the computer down from inside it. She is knocked out slash killed by the computer, but her actions have given Superman enough time to fly away and return with the acid from the factory scene earlier. Yeah, I'm keeping that too. It might be a little silly, but it's a setup and payoff I actually like from the original movie. Anyway, Superman destroys the computer with the acid, and Gus is released from its grip. Webster and Vera go to jail, and Gus and Lorelai, if she survives, are given a second chance by Superman. Now, obviously, this story suggestion isn't perfect either, but I think if it was committed to by a screenwriter who wasn't the Newmans, the chances for a good Superman movie are there. Or at the very least, a movie that makes you go, eh, that was alright. Now, originally, I was going to share a full break down for my second concept, the one that would have zeroed in on the Smallville stuff and focused more on the environmental threads that the original movie plays with. But then I realized that a very recent Superman property actually follows this concept pretty closely. Superman and Lois. The general plot of Superman and Lois is simple. Clark and Lois move back to Smallville with their two sons in the wake of Martha's death, and they grow to love the little farm town. However, they quickly learn that Morgan Edge is proposing to bring new jobs to the town with a new mining project, one that troubles Clark and Lois a great deal. Edge has a nasty track record record for pollution. They investigate several seemingly disconnected threads and follow them to their source point, that being Edge and his real plans for the town. I'm not going to spoil much in case someone here hasn't seen it, but that's about the size of it. In a way, Superman and Lois really shows how good Superman 3 could have been. It handles the idea of Superman coming back home to his Smallville beautifully, from Clark reeling from the loss of his mother to the slow decay of the town and the desperation to bring it back to life. This dovetails beautifully with the story of Morgan Edge, the businessman who's going to destroy 
destroy the town and its surrounding environment for the sake of his own personal glory. Making sure that Clark is personally involved with Edge 2, with him having bought the Daily Planet out some time ago, makes this even tighter. The concept of evil Superman has even worked in there, albeit in a very different manner than it was in the original movie. Now, do I think a Superman 3 that followed these threads would have looked exactly like Superman and Lois? I don't think so. The twin sons wouldn't be there, obviously, but neither would Lois. Remember, we're working under the restraint of the Salkins being massive weenies. So if we were to take the skeleton of Superman and Lois and imagine it as an alternate Superman 3, some things would need changing. Some things are obvious, like taking out several plot lines that exist to pull the story out from a movie to a 15 episode television season, but others are more fundamental. For example, remove Superman's family and replace them with all the stuff with Lana in the original movie. Her wanting to leave Smallville, but still trying to make it a better place. And of course, we could begin this movie with the news that Edge has bought the planet and is moving into Smallville with his mining plan. As for what Edge's master plan is here, I must admit I haven't worked that out quite yet. A massive part of his plan in the series involves looking for a specific type of kryptonite, so maybe we could work that in here. Edge is looking for Kryptonian elements in a quest to create his own Superman, but in the end only ends up making an imperfect copy. One who has all the moral sense of a five-year-old. Hey, look at that, I got Bizarro into this shit. There's your big comic book villain for this movie. Again, I don't think this possible sketch that I admit I'm half ripping off from a more modern TV show would be perfect. In fact, my idea of throwing Bizarro in there threatens to make this movie pretty silly. But I still think that this idea would be an effective use of elements from the original movie to make something better, something more coherent, which is the point of this thought experiment. By the way, if you have any other ideas, throw them in the comments too. I really want to hear your hypothetical alternate Superman 3s. Hell, they'll probably be better than mine. <sighs> If you've managed to get to the end, thank you so much for watching. It amazes me that I've written so much about this movie. For most of my life, everything I thought about this movie could have been summed up with, yeah, it was dumb, but I like the bad Superman stuff. For this reason, I wasn't sure about this video and had no idea how to approach it. But the overwhelming reception to my previous Superman videos and a rewatch of this movie really inspired me to dig deep into this movie and explore what about it doesn't work. So what's my final conclusion after this hour-long rant about how it's bad, then it's good, and how it could have been worse, and how it could have been better. It's that, as I've stated a lot, there's a fantastic movie hiding in this mess. There are so many threads and ideas that should have made for the best Superman movie of all time, but they're all squandered, not just by Richard Lester's tendency towards sight gags or the Newman's mind-bogglingly weird script, but mostly by the Salkins. If there's something that's underlined by this movie's existence, it's that the Salkins were idiots. Most of every decision they ever made involving the Superman series was bad, and it is pretty well on record that the reason that the first two weren't disasters was down to Richard Donner making extensive changes to their plans. Remember, the Superman movie from 1978 wasn't the one the Salgans had originally envisioned. As stated earlier, the script they commissioned from the Newmans for that movie was in Donna's eyes stupid and unusable, leading to him bringing Mankiewicz in to rewrite the whole thing. It was Donna that insisted on Reeve for Superman, as opposed to the Salgans' plans to cast someone like Dustin Hoffman. Sure, Superman 2 turned out fine in their hands without Donna, but they were still pretty much working from his structure of that movie. But with Superman 3, they were truly allowed to show their idea of what Superman should be in film, the result being loud, nonsensical, and filled with extremely lame comedy. Unlike Donna and Reeve, it's clear that the Salkins didn't take Superman very seriously at all, seeing it as something for the kiddies. And if there's something that I am frustrated to find continues to happen in film, it's that Superman has been and will probably always be given to people who don't understand the character or what he stands for. The flashes of good character writing for Clark in this movie are good, but I feel it's safe to say that most of it is by accident. After all, if you paint in broad strokes, you're gonna be inside the lines once or twice. So yeah, Superman 3 is a mess. But at least it's an interesting mess. One that has a lot going on and even things to really love in it. As I said in the beginning, I borderline unironically love it, what's and all. It's not by any definition of the word a good movie, but I don't find it's a terrible one either. Now if we're talking about a terrible Superman movie, we all know where to look.